I don't think you need much introduction. Linda, Charlene, um, we're very much looking forward to listening to you both, engaging with you. Um, and thank you so much for kicking off the last day of a wonderfully engaged and exciting three days. Welcome, everyone. All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being patient. The keynotes were here on time. We thought today we'll, everything will be clockwork, everything. We'll have enough time because we've also felt that we've been rushing and no one has had the time to engage with keynotes. So we thought, okay, today we're going to do our keynotes quickly, have a time for all of us to sit and discuss and have different kinds of questions. But it is what it is. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, this is not really a keynote. We did have a keynote, and this year has shown us flames in every way. I've just been, I just came back from Ethiopia where I organized a conference that was canceled, not canceled, canceled. Um, and, then, and then it was Athens, and when Shalin said, oh, there's stuff on the streets of, of, Bram, uh, of Bramfontein, I said, we're not canceling another conference. We're not. Um, we were supposed to have a keynote pass. Uh, uh, we had three keynote speakers, and the earlier, earlier programs, for those of you who have, um, are very observant, you'll see there was a keynote speaker who things just happened, life just happened, and the keynote couldn't come. And Shalene called me as I was on the way to this Ethiopian conference, and I was just like, we'll do the keynote. Now I'm like, what did I say, and why, and why did you not talk me out of this? So this for me is not a keynote, it's a tribute. It's a tribute, but what, I am take, what I'm taking comfort in is two things. You've had two excellent keynotes. Shalin's going to be excellent, I know. Um, and one thing that Kanita said, Kanita, where are you? One thing Kanita said is don't be afraid to fail. So if this is a failure, I don't care. But anyway, <laughs> but what it is for me and what is really important is that it's a, for me, my, my role today or my, my job today is very simple, um, but I take it seriously, is to give a tribute to Molaro Gundipe. Molaro Gundipe Leslie um, described herself as a writer who became an academic. She was a writer poet, a professor of gender, women's studies, and literary the theory, and she was also a consultant. Her, do her daughters described her work as one that underscored the necessity to comprehensively analyze pre-colonial, colonial, and neo-colonial gender dynamics in order to formulate and redress the condition of African women. For decades, she worked tirelessly in gender studies and feminist activism, mentoring young women and men on gender equality, feminist theory, and ethics. I came to African feminism through Molaro Gundipe's interpretation of the mountain metaphor. In an article in Nambika, Studies of, African, Afri of Women in African Literature, edited by Carol Boyce Davis and Anne Adams Gra Graves. She says, and she has this an article in which she says that she <coughs> quotes the Chinese philosopher <coughs> Mao Zedong, who said that the Chinese man had three mountains to carry on his back. Oppression from outside, uh, by this, he was referring to what, the fact that at certain points in his, of history in China, China was colonized. The second mountain was a heritage of tradition, his backwardness because of poverty and ignorance. But he then added that the Chinese woman had one additional mountain to carry, the Chinese man. Molaro Gundipe extended on this metaphor by arguing that women in Africa have to carry two extra mountains on their backs, her class on the one hand and or her race, and the sixth mountain is herself. This let metaphor left an impression on, on me. It provided me with the theoretical and analytical tools in very simple but profound ways in which to speak about women's issues on the continent. This metaphor helped me from my location in South Africa, in Africa, to understand what feminisms on the continent could be like. 
Pumla Gola argues that these six mountains on our backs represent the meanings emanating from our location in Africa with the accompanying history of interlocking oppressions in the burdens we carry. However, she says, because these are, are on our back, meaning the mountains, we are able to move with them. This analogy is mindful of the nexus of power relations at play in black women's lives, whilst acknowledging the agency with, with which we engage with the, with the mountains. The mountains for Pumla are says they are not overwhelming, even if they're monumental and strenuous, and we are not passive. Secondly, it is from Molaro Gundipe that I learned to speak of African feminisms as opposed to African feminism. Mm. She argued that they cannot be a one size fits all in relation to feminism in Africa. And we should think of various feminism. And for most of us who are, who are engaged in African feminisms, we know that especially from um, West Africa, in particular Nigeria, there are lots of, there are about five or six different feminisms. Um, if we look at Oguime's African womanism, or Kola Wole's Africana womanism, of Atro, or Atronolu's motherism, or um, I, I can, um, as people, please Joy, just forgive my pronunciation, <laughs> snail, smell, snail sense feminism, or Obioma Nayameka's Negro feminism. You see that there are different kinds of feminisms. Later in her scholarly life, Oguntipe began to advocate for a specific kind of feminism, stiwanism, social transformation, including women in Africa. She argued that she created stiwanism because the word feminism seems to be a kind of red rag to the bull of African men. Molaro Gundipe, for her, what Siwanism was a way to study African feminisms as they specifically relate to history, gender, politics, race, e economics, and social dy dynamics. Ogondipe Leslie considered a plethora of influence to various notions of feminism in Africa to ensure an effective critique of gender issues in Africa. For her, Stiwa is about the inclusion of African women in, contem in the contemporary social and political transformation of Africa. To be a stewardess is to engage in this kind of fem uh, feminism. So when we were putting together the first conference, for me it was important to return to Ogundipe. Firstly, to the mountain metaphor. And secondly, since this was going to be a, a conference that focused on feminism in Africa, we decided to abbreviate and define the conference series as AFEMS and not AFEM, so that it would be inclusive of different forms of feminism. At the end of, and I had slides to show what we did, and we have quite, for, for those of you who have been with us from 2017, Butle had a beautiful cover of what, her interpretation of the mountain of the back, on the back. And Butle then made these um, beautiful, uh, what are the art pieces, which we now have in the Department of English, Literary Studies of English. And it was, this is the homage we were paying to Ogundipe. At the end of last year, Shailene was again, and in that case, I was drawn to Ogundipe, but at the end of last year, Shailene again was drawn to Ogundipe's ideas, and she went to an article in which Ogundipe is talking to Des South African feminist Desiree Lewis, and in which she interviews Ogundipe about her ideas and, uh, and thinking of feminism. And this is part, and I'll, I'll read it extensively, of what she says and what Shailene and I then used to create or to theorize or to create this call for papers for this conference. She said, for me, social ideas should emerge from a consciousness that thinks of what is beneficial to a human being as a person. Not because the ideas occurred or are practiced in Europe or America. We used to overcome our, we need, sorry, to overcome our endemic inferiority complex towards Europe and things white successfully implanted since our colonial education and through its curricula. We should think 
from our epicenters of agency, looking for what is meaningful, progressive, and useful to us as Africans as we enrich ourselves with forerunning ideas from all over the world, including Europe and Africa. I felt that as a concerned African as, as concerned African women, we need to focus on our areas of concern, socially and geographically. I'm concerned with the critical and social transformations of a positive nature in Africa. Positive meaning being Positive mean, meaning being considered with everything that maximizes the quality of life of Africans and their potentials too. For Shalene, this conversation foregrounds issues that continue to reverberate with black African post-colonial feminists in Africa and beyond. Lived experiences as sites of knowledge, epistemologies tied to geospecific bodies, long heterogeneous world histories that coexist co with indigenous knowledges, cultural sippage, humanistic philosophical stances that refuse the othering of African or Africans and claim our space and place in world making, embodied thinking, doing, a plurality of feminisms that respond to the diversity of African women, the centrality of women in decolonial paradigms, an acknowledgement of acts of agency that define Africans on a daily basis and a good dose of hopefulness for the future, even if in these times it seems hopeless. Because of her influence on our thinking, and since we had returned to her ideas for AFEMS 2019, we thought we, would, we could invite her to be one of our keynote speakers. And so I tried to contact her. I tried for two months to contact Molaro Gendupe. I tried with, through all my networks, and I had no idea how to find her. I even went onto her Facebook, and I DM'd her. And for two months, I want to say stopped. I think I trolled her. And I just <laughs> wanted to find where is she, and I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing from her. The last time she was on Facebook was in December 2018. When I started contacting her, it was in January. I thought, yeah, you know, I'm not regular on Facebook. Maybe she'll come back. And until after about three months, Chalene said, we can't find her. We don't know where she is. No one could tell us where she was. And we decided to find um, alternatives. And so when I heard in June about her transitioning, I was in shock. I was in utter shock. But I'm consoled by what she says about death. She says, when death for her in the Yoruba culture is understood as that when, death, when one dies, one joins the ancestors. Their departure is not a source of sadness, particularly if that person has had a lived and fulfilling life. The funeral should be a celebration of life, an, an, an acknowledgement of that person's achievements, unless that person, that death, is the person of a young person such as Uyinene, Karabo, James, Hannah, Baby Lee, mm -hmm. Caitlin, and any woman that you know whose death has been taken by, by violence. Then we have to mourn. When that, that is when we mourn those people. But for Molaro Gundipe, even if I was shocked, even if I was sad, even if I mourned a bit for her, I know that she has joined the ancestors. And I know I personally will, be, will continue to be inspired by her ideas. Rest peacefully, Professor Ugundipe. You will always be remembered for your intellect and your radical feminist activism. And after all this, after we had <coughs> done all this, I get a message from one of my friends who's like, no. But I, I'm sitting with somebody who knew Molaro Gundipe, who works with me, who knows her daughter. It's like, this is what I was looking for. 
at the beginning of the year. And so for me, it's coming full circle. And I feel that it is important that Professor Ogundipe, one of her daughters, Titi Leslie, has, sent, has written a tribute to her mother. And she has said that we should read her tribute today. We had it on screen, but we don't have it here. And because I because it's important for me and because it's important for this conference, I thought that Josephine Alexander, who knew her personally, would read this tribute from her daughter. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, I'm going to go straight to read Titi's poem, and I will say a little bit of my interaction and you know, how I have known uh, the person that we call Mama, we call her Mama, we don't call her by her full name. So this poem is a mom's poem titled Iya, Mother in Yoruba, our mother uh, in Amharic as Yeya Enat. Mothers are never selfishly possessed, nor girls' children bound in basis rules of residence. Vortex, conduit, door of life, future, hope, and love's respite. Swelling, twirling, enabling enigma of existence, an audience to vain delight. Unfixed by cares of molds, jealously, enviously, seeking to tip her tight. Life's source, ending futures bright, craving pain and living right. Worlds, oh, worlds of time away, yet deep within reside, guiding, hiding, searing light. Mothers are never selfishly possessed, nor God's children bound in basis rules of residence. Brilliance, ego, forced to be, Ogun's lyric, power's might. Pounding, provoking, yam sustainers of effects ephemeral, entwining inspirations, once furious, fleeting, and in flight. Your love like deep, dark amala, sustaining us to times of strife. Life's content, feeling, present light, loving bright, jowled to a right. Mothers are never selfishly possessed, nor girls children bound in basis rules of residence. Furious tempest of pain's anger, lovely legionary of justice, ranger, here by me, in me, near indeed, new manifested abiding sight, on power's pondering pool of narcissi, uttered there, children of those great remain, earthen bound not to be permitted flight, patient loves forgiven, masters the sum of all blight. Mothers are never selfishly possessed, nor girls children bound in basis rules of residence. Beyond life's ending, sojourners here, transient to sound, somnolence. That's the poem from Titi. So um, in 1981, 82 session, um, I was a student, a first year student in Molara Ogundipe, Leslie then. Um, and she was such an inspiration to all of us because she was just different. She was this radical <coughs> woman, and we hear all sorts of stories about her. But beyond that, it's her intellect. You know, like when she stands in front of you in class, she's got no paper, no books, nothing, and she just speaks. <coughs> and we look up to her as one of those people who inspired us. But my personal relationship with her happened in the classroom. She had a kind of giving an example of which I have a counter example of. And 
I just, you know, I was young and, you know, um, and I've always been very affirmative. So I just said, I just put up my hand and I said, you know, I have a counter example and this is how it worked. It's about multilingualism. And I come from a state in Nigeria where um, almost every other town has a different language. So I use that as like my example. And that was it. She took me as her daughter. She just loved the fact that, you know, as a, as a first year student, I could look up to a professor and say, I've got an example, you know, that is different from what you have given. And in, in a way, actually saying, um, you are not quite right about what you've said because I have an alternative um, example. And, and, and that was it. She groomed me to become an academic. You know, I call her my, uh, my academic mom. So um, it was like that. And she's the kind of person who relates with her students as if that they are friends. So she comes to the poetry club, which I coordinated. And then she left, and she was a pioneering professor for Ogun State University. That's the state from which she comes from. And I was very lucky, because when I had to do my um, service year, I was posted to Agoyewoye, which is the town where her dad um, um, comes from. And, and just by accident, I, I met her, you know, one day. And she said, no, you must come to the department. You must apply, you know, and all of that. So at the end of my service years, I, I applied, and I got a position as a graduate assistant. And, and, and so that's how my academic life started. And, you know, of course, she made sure that I started the master's and all of that. And then she went away to, um, to the US. And each time she was home, she was always in my house. We slept on the same bed. We ate. You know, I was there for her when her mother passed away with all of her friends in my house. But just one thing that I want to say is that I lost contact with her for a long time. And then one day, one of our classmates called me to say she was dying. And I was in tears. You know, like, I didn't know what to do. And Titi was far away. And there was nobody. So I, I called one of our classmates, uh, Professor Remy Rajio Yelade, and I, and I said to, to him, Mama is dying at UCH, and I needed people to go. So he went, and he called Professor um, Femi Osofison and some other friends, you know, who knew her, whom she worked with. And they went to UCH, and luckily enough, she was able to recognize them. She was very weak. She couldn't talk to them as much, but they stayed with her for as much as they could. And I'm glad that I was able to do that for her. And I couldn't reach her, just like you. You know, I tried everything. I couldn't reach her. And then, you know, she was discharged. And I just want to say that up to the last minute, she was teaching. She, she was teaching in a private university in, in Abelkuta in Ogun State. It's called Mac 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 Mapexin University. And that's where she took ill and they took her to the, um, to the hospital. And when she was back, she really wanted to go back to teach, but they, they knew how fragile you know, um, she was. And so she was there. But the, the good thing was also like Titi was with her for, I think, November and December of 2018. And so she had the opportunity for, for her mom to tell her what she really wanted to be done and how she wanted to, she wants to be remembered. So I'm going to be liaising with the two of you as soon as Titi has her project put together. I will let you know all of uh, the content and um, see where, how you can be part of it because it, it is a big project. And, and so um, she finally died. And she died in her mother's hometown, Ijebuibo. And before she died, she became a Catholic. And, uh, you know, and um, um, the funeral was like, all of us were waiting for this big celebration, you know, of her life. And then all of a sudden, the first friend, the first classmate who called me told me that she's been buried. And we were like, how can they bury her like that? You know, like, this is not somebody that should just be buried like that. And then finally, I get, got hold of Titi, and we've been talking. And what happened is that you know she's got two daughters. They were really brought up in Nigeria. And so the family took over the funeral, and Titi was just so destroyed that she didn't want to like, uh, cause anything. So she says, OK, my mom can be buried. She can go to sleep. But Titi is planning something big for next year, and it's part of the project. And I just want to say thank you for using this time to honor her. She's my mom. I share, you know, with Titi, um, her mother. 
And luckily enough for me, you know, there was a time when Titi was in Nigeria, so I knew her before and we were good friends. So we just, it kind of started off from where we stopped. And I want to say, Eshe Pupo Adupe. Mama Ogundipe. E Oku Toripe. I want to say, Eshe Sile. Osi Walaye. I'm saying that she's not dead because her legacy is still on. Thank you, Jesus, for her life. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Josephine. Um, I'm a little choked up myself. Um, so, Thank you very much, Linda, for that as well. Um, it's really, you know, difficult to lose people like this and just because um, of how much they mean to our lives and how much they've given to our lives even though we haven't met them. As many of you know, on the 5th of August, 2019, just one month ago, African-American novelist Toni Morrison passed away. In life, the United States of America got to claim her as a daughter, but as her death is so clearly revealed, Toni Morrison was more than any nationality, any race, any gender label. That is not to say Toni shied away from these categorizations. If anything, her work so intimately weaves what Kimberly Crenshaw has termed the intersectionality of power matrices that teaching a Toni Morrison book remains tricky for many. How can you deal with the complicatedness of race, gender, class, sexuality, education, religion, nationality? Curricula usually requires the deconstructions of things into knowable parts and is assisted by language in its teleological fallacy, whereas life is all at once, all too much. There are many literary scholars more brilliant than I who will do greater justice to Morrison's extensive body of work that has already passed into canons and will probably make new ones, so I will not dwell on Morrison's work. What I want to pay tribute to here today as well is Morrison's actions, the way she lived her life, the choices she made that turned Chloe Anthony Walford into the esteemed Professor Emeritus, Toni Morrison. First, let's be clear. There are many who use the title of genius undeservedly. But for me, Toni Morrison was an actual genius who lived in our time. Morrison acknowledged how difficult it was for women of color to find spaces in a, and I quote, genderized, sexualized, wholly racialized world, unquote. This is not just the real physical world but the world of colonial racist phallocentric language. To understand that one is not separate from the other, but rather agonistically calls the other into being was one of the most important messages of her 1997 Nobel lecture. Speaking on language, she says, and I quote, the kind of work I always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister frequently lazy, almost always predictable employment of racially informed and determined chains." Unquote. For those of us with black lives that try to communicate the excessiveness of it in linear language, we know the tussle with language and too often are falling short with it. Morrison's sheer brilliance was how she grafted, carved, molded, and made yield that language to her voice, even unto itself, revealing those empowered by its illusions. Too often it is difficult for those in power to read her work. If you're offended by the sex and, vi and violence on display, ask yourself why. If you're offended by all that racialized and classed history soaking everything, ask yourself why. If you're upset by the fluidity of sexuality, ask yourself why. If it's all just too much, ask yourself why. 
After all, it is only words on a page. Morrison's narratives are too much because black lives are too much, because the colonized lives are too much, because being a woman is too much. What do I mean by black lives? It's like if you happen to write down a story about all that just happened in this week in Johannesburg or South Africa, maybe even what it took for you to get here to Athens, nobody would believe you. Your editor or scriptwriter will tell you, tell you you can't have so, such an action-packed story with one thing happening after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. The reader needs a break allow to collect themselves, the ebb and flow of narrative that builds into a crescendo. Real black lives don't story arc. They register like needles recording seismic activity. And you're thinking too much? That was just the last month or year of my life. Imagine if I wrote it all down. Black lives are too much. They are excessive and they exceed. And Morrison made no apology for that. How do we live with the men that abuse, hurt, and rape us? How do we deal with the patriarchal betrayals of other women? How do we forgive ourselves when we meant well, but? If black lives are too much, black interiorities are complex, ambiguous, at the best of times, and utterly contradictory. The characters Morrison writes can love, hurt, hate, and heal in measures that match the diversiveness of our situations as survival strategies. In The Bluest Eye, for instance, Morrison forces you into the mind of a rapist father and pedophile. To read the thoughts of both as they sexualize a child and proceed to enact that violence is an emotional and mental violence that is almost too much to read. <clears throat> there are no trigger warnings in Morrison's book. And yet in doing so, she exposes the violations they themselves has endure, have endured to become the violators. And when you find yourself feeling pity for a character that you know has caused such harm in one way or another, it's not the Hollywood akshay, but the grudgingness of knowing in another place or another time, might this person have been me, my loved one, my family, <coughs> my friend? In doing so, Morrison's work transcends the particularity of the US and African American experiences as we find ourselves in our families, our secret shames, and our wistful longings in her imaginary world. Her work envisions what Nikki Giovanni has termed as the universal in the particular. As a child growing up under apartheid, even in settings that were only people of color, popular culture ingrained in me a racially inferior complex. In my fantasies, I was a white girl called Christina with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a wonderful body. I could run, jump, swim, ski. When I was 16 years old, I got blue contact lens. They fitted good enough for people to believe that they were actually real. People got stupid around me, but it still took me four years to get rid of them for good. Three years later, as I was starting my MA, I came across the ma mention of the Blue Stein in a number of Bell Hooks' writings. I borrowed the book, and for the first time, I did not read a book from start to finish. For weeks at a time, I would put it down and weep. Mm. Morrison hurt me in indescribable ways as she cut through my racial epidermalization and self-hatred. I cried not for Pekala, but for myself. Because in another space, in another time, I could have been Pekola wandering about, having been driven mad by all of it. Morrison and Hooks, over many years, cleaned out the pass of apartheid and suited me back up. The scar remains, and so does their love. Because love hurts, but it is also that thing that heals and moves us to act. It is the epicenter from which so much of our agency emanates. 
Morrison's novels never does leave one with despair, no matter how much he devastated the reader. Her novels are lined with laughter, feminist support, a choice, a different perspective, even as she understood that although everyone has agency, not everyone chooses to act agentically. Morin exert, Morrison exerted her agency not just for or on herself, but on others that she came into contact with. Her work as editor of Random, at Random House and what that meant not just for African-American literature, but women's writing more gen generally has been highlighted since her death. Morrison taught me that seeing people's potential and understanding that you can use your platform, your encouragement, your energy, sometimes even a bit of feminist bullying, otherwise known as foresight or vision, <laughs> to showcase or bring out people's greatness, particularly when they don't see it in themselves at a particular time. That is an act of love for a person, for a craft, for a field, for society, for history. Morrison taught me that loving yourself and what you do and knowing the value of that is also an act of love that demands the same level of agency. She knew when to withdraw. I remember reading a post in the discussion group how some people at one of her academic institutions were disappointed by her not engaging more with the students on, on their MA program. And here I want to say a hard truth to a room full of women of color, feminists, young and old. In a world that simply takes from women and doesn't acknowledge or support young women of color, when you are in an academic or mentoring role, you will be asked to exert yourself to the point that nobody cares whether you are coping or how you are doing. People will make the most unreasonable last request on you constantly. They will ask you to be a shadow helper because they don't want you to, they don't want to stand up to the people authorized to help them, but they expect that free labor from you rather than the labor of speaking out. They will expect and demand and manipulate to get things out of you. And when all said and done for the 10 that you have helped and sometimes even saved, you will be lucky enough if even one turns back and says, thank you. It's all about them, never you. They drain you out and use you up, and when that's done, they will say, you didn't help me when I needed it now. How many of them actually stop to ask you, how can I help you? How many of the people, young or old, have asked you how you are doing and actually cared long enough to wait for an answer? How many of them have tried to see how you are being emptied out and decided to put something back into you? And yes, I'm still talking about men and women of color here. I haven't even touched on the dailiness of institutional violence and trauma that you endure because you convince yourself that being in the space is more important than not. But when was the last time someone gave you time on space or just a cup of unasked for coffee? So when I heard that Toni Morrison was not giving off her time as much as she was expected to, I figured that for someone who had published only at the age of 39, who worked full time and wrote part time and fed so many people with the editorial work and presence in random publishing house, who taught and lectured and spoke and wrote essays, that if anything in her 50s and 60s, she damn well deserved some time. <laughs> and to determine how she wanted to engage it. They had her books, they had her talks, they had her essays, they had her on campus, but it's never enough from women of color, academics and scholars. Morrison, like Hooks, like Ama'atu Aidu, like Sarah Ahmed, taught me that there was nothing wrong with me being me. When I started encountering videos of them talking straight and talking back with an unmatched fearlessness and intelligence and beauty, I came to know that I was not wrong in my killjoyness. Morrison's life also showed that we will always be too busy. Busy, 
all the time. And yet history demands that we do what we do. We do not have the luxury of singular lives and singular tasks and singular careers. As women of color, we are always working against time, working against history, working against violent acts that aim to sweep us away. We do not have time, therefore, to be perfectionists. And that's okay. So many of us are weighted by time, history, and violence that came before us that we feel we have to get things just right. Well, sometimes we just have to do and let history judge us. I love the story of Morrison celebrating her Nobel Award announcement by saying that of course she knew it came at the cost of someone else losing, but she was going to celebrate anyway. Understanding the worth of what we do, often the mere act of doing is sometimes a feminist act. Afems is built on theorizing from the agency or from the epicenters of doing. We soon simply do not have the money, resources, networks, and institutional support to pull us off. The hardcore reality is that despite what is said, nobody wants to fund a conference with majority African women of color scholars. The African body is always up for saving, but that stops short of engaging African minds. And yet here we are in our third year with the next two editions planned, the 2020 edition for UCT and the 2021 edition returning to Makanda one final time to celebrate its five year anniversary where it was born. I take note of that. You don't have to be in kingdoms to start something amazing. Sometimes you can be in the desert, quite literally. <laughs> as painful as it is trying to raise, cajole, and even beg money from various people, we pull off our firms usually with half the budget that we need because we can and because we must. This highlights what curator Zodwa Tutani Skei said on the AFM's curatorial panel last year, that it is crazy that black women curators struggle so hard to get funding given how much black women have done with so little money. But unfortunately, even though we make this conference seem special with the little we raise, and I hope you agree that it is quite a special conference, it perhaps has given some people the belief that we have a huge budget and that we raise a huge sum from registration fees. Various people have canceled because they said that the registration fee of 500 or 250 was prohibitive. Some of these cases are genuine where people really can't afford it. In cases where people have not been able to pay the registration fee and have written in, we have bartered skills. Others who could afford it to but, but who chose to make a stand or a statement that they will not attend the conference because of registration fees, we respect that. Let's be clear though. With all our AFMs, attendance into every AFMs panel is free because we fundamentally believe that knowledge should be free and accessible. What is not free, however, are all the teas, lunches, and dinners that we make available. For this year's AFMs, our catering budget stands at 164,972 rands, which amounts to 1,099 rands 81 cents per person for lunch, dinner, and tea. That means our catering budget costs us a total of 164,972,000 out of the 265,432 rands that we were able to raise for the conference this year. That's more than half our budget with some very inventive catering solutions, as you saw on Monday. <laughs> the total income generated from registration fees is about 45,000 rand, of which 5% will be taken by the ticketing website that you registered on. The cost, can we put the budget up? The cost of the final dinner tonight <coughs> is 40, 40 something thousand, which is basically all of your registration fees. So your 500 rand registration fees only covers half your meals and teas and is actually subsidized by the funding we raise. 
And yet we have guests that truly believe we are making money from this conference. Which is why we want to open up our books to you and be accountable to this community. I remember growing up when, when my dad used to bring home his pay and give my mom his paycheck and we would go shopping. My mom would write a list and calculate what to buy for the week down to every cent. My dad would then go into the shop and be buying all kinds of unnecessary items for his sweet tooth. And I remember that more than, I remember more than my, once my mom standing in, in, in line crying at the tiller because she had to put items aside or them having a fight in the store about this. My dad worked hard, often chew jobs and gave her the money and did not want to be involved in the budget. His part was done. Sometimes FMs makes me feel like my mom the week or two before, cutting out a biscuit and a sandwich here just to make things work. And the pain of being treated as if we are withholding. I refuse to be like my mom and weep silently. So we're showing you our budget because we believe in fiscal transparency. We want you to know where every cent raised goes. But you can also see, perhaps as a community, not privy to this information usually, how we go about doing this. There's no magic to this. There's a lot of hustling on the AFM's coordinating team part and sheer generosity from our funders who believe in this platform and support without any mandate. Last year, Rosemary J. Jolly from Penn State University visited and she loved AFM so much that she decided she wanted to donate $10,000 this year. I said that's great, so long as she understood that donations did not mean any stake in the AFM's format. She completely agreed and this year $10,000 is half our budget and made AFM's 2019 possible. Nolakola and Flaco for the second year in a row committed 15,000 to, to AFMs, which allowed us to bring a taxi load of Makanda Roads community, because even as we've moved to Vitz, we want to continue the network established with our community down there. I mean, and you have to say, right, the Roads performances, amazing. Nolakola, has said that she would like to try and support AFMS 2020 again in a similar capacity. There is also a lot of free labor, whether it is our AFMS coordinating team who perform the role of events manager, a job that costs 40 to 50,000, to Ford down here who has done all the designs and layout for AFMS every year, with no promise of money, to Jan Schechter, who has spent a lot of time getting us up on the I Am Citizen platform, to the Kapi and Art on Our Mind students and other volunteers. So it is a lot of free labor. What you're seeing, what you're seeing on the screen is how much we raised from the different sources. And then if you go down, you'll see all our expenditures. That doesn't take into money the kinds of incidentals that we're going to come up with. Now, can you show the other one? No. So ideally, to run FMs the way we are right now, the ideal budget is around 550000 Okay, That's what it takes for 150 guests. Only 150. But, so this is what our ideal kind of budget would look like, go up, up, up. For the first time, we were even able to give key, our keynotes a bit of a stipend. We've never been able to do that before. Everyone has done it. We've given them like 130 rands or something a day. So if you go onto the I Am Citizen platform, you can see all these funding documents. Okay, it's open. All our homegrown skills, thanks for it. Yeah. All our homegrown skills as women of color come to bear on Athens that it takes ingenuity to make things stretch and to count every nickel and dime. 
We are able to do, do this because even though as African women we carry those six mountains on our backs, one of which is money, and that's what Malare Stevenson was incredibly important in teaching us, we are still moving. And despite all these challenges, AFMS is moving forward. We want to think about how we can publish these conference proceedings, as many of you have expressed interest in doing so. But that takes time, effort, and yes, more money. But my vision ultimately is to start an African feminist press here and publish our own books. Yeah. We want AFMS to be able to travel around the country for the next two years. As I said, it will be at UCT and Rhodes because we want to grow our community and make it possible for people in other parts of the country to access FMs. After that, it will likely become a conference that happens every second year. We want to be more inventive about our fundraising, so we are not spending every year on the back foot trying to get FMs off the ground that year. And we're hoping to do that with a new community and funding platform called I Am Citizen. Um, this platform is run by Indiegogo. And uh, Rosemary Jolly put us in touch with Janice Schechter, who took on this project for free. With this platform, we are able to place all our funding documents and in, online and invite and build a support network that will hopefully see fit to fund FMs. Beside funding, though, what excites me about I Am Citizen is that it gives us the possibility to create and sustain the FMs community beyond the yearly conference. As FM participants, you can register on the FM's page and start talking to each other and posting material that is relevant to the FM's community all year round. So there are so many skills and talents and opportunities in this room if we can choose to harness them. Again, what FM's is about is aiming to create a platform for you to engage other like-minded people and promote your work. FM, FM's works and has works from the first edition, but the absolute generosity of spirit and intellect that all of its participants bring with them. All of you. All of you have expended much energy, time, creativity, and monies to be part of FM's. You are FM's. If FM's is about doing, then you are the embodiment of that doing. And we are incredibly grateful to be able to provide you with an intellectual creative hub from which you, you can theorize from the epicenters of your doing. Morrison and Bell Hooks, I mention them in one breath because I came to know of one through the other and their work is so fundamental to what I've become. They bring tears to my eyes each time I think of them. I think what my life and my scholarship might have been without them and all that I've become and what I can do for others is part of their legacy. I don't know if they can understand what they mean to women of scholars across the world, but if I had to sum it up in one word, it would be love. I know I love them. They taught, they taught me that even though I have never met them, that love can travel through time and space and through creative labor and fundamentally change someone's life. These are important lessons for me because sometimes it feels like what we do as creative practitioners, as theorists, as university scholars is not real, not really important. And yet there's nothing less real about having your being moved by creativity. Love transcends from the particular to the universal and back again. When we combine the transcendental qualities of love and creativity, when we understand they come from the same space, I am hopeful that what I wake up for and work for every day is not for waste. This is why for Linda and myself, creativities remain the central axis around which AFMS rotates. And we hope that AFMS continues to grow as it rotates and gets taken over by new members, and we really mean that, taken over by new members because all we did was give it birth. It will continue to use creativities and love as a methodology which speaks to the lives of African women. Thank you. <laughs>